Welcome to the Beast Rider family where social media engagement is encouraged. I am your host, Ryan Sakamoto, and today we are going to be continuing my NFL draft grades as it pertains to all 32 NFL teams. This time we're sticking within the AFC West, breaking down the last team in the AFC West in the Los Angeles Chargers and why I believe they hit it out of the ballpark with their first two selections, which enhances basically their 2021 season chances of actually making a deep playoff run. That is correct. The LA Chargers are the one team that's really building teams from the inside out. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in detail. So before we go ahead and do that, I just want to say thank you as always, as I do in every podcast to each and every one of you for subscribing to my channel. Just be sure to turn on and flip on the bell notifications so you get notified when I go live or when I upload content. If you're watching my community page up on YouTube, I like to keep things up to date in between posting my content videos. And you guys will see on the community page, my latest community post was where Runa Pereira was last week's winner of the Beast Rider family giveaway. I actually went out to his house, took it a step further. I really got to know uh, him. He actually invited me to his house. That was like really like shocking and uh, honored to be honest with you. and really met his family and that I mean that we're here that's what the Beast Rider family is all about it's just about the good vibes only and really bridging the gap with all 32 fan bases lock stepped into one so I was actually in Sacramento and we went ahead and met up and it was a really really cool time to really re meet Waruna uh and his family so thank you Waruna if you're watching this all right so we're just gonna go ahead and dive right into it the Beast Rider family giveaways are gonna be going on forever till the day I die we're doing another one obviously at 2.30 p.m. on our live stream on Friday, if not a little bit earlier. All right, so with that being said, let's go ahead and break down the Los Angeles Chargers. You guys have been waiting for this. Starting with, let me put up the ticker here, Rashawn Slater. All right, so Rashawn Slater, let me just pull up the ticker. It's up there, right? Yeah. So Rashawn Slater was drafted in the first round, number 13 overall, and this was a perfect selection for GM Tom Telesco where need meets best player available. It created a perfect storm. Like GM Tom Telesco let the board talk just like any good GM would if you're a good GM and he gets the blindside protector for Justin Herbert. That's something that the Chargers really needed because under Anthony Lynn, they really didn't have that blindside protector. And when you take into account what they have currently on their roster, Trey Pip Pipkins, excuse me, Trey Pipkins, is he the answer? I don't think so. I don't think Trey Pipkins is the answer. And GM Tom Telesco threw a huge smoke screen in his pre-draft pressers saying, oh, yeah, we're bullish on Trey Pipkins. And my mind was like, no, actions speak louder than words ever will. Go to the game film. Go to the film study. Watch the film tape. And you will know that Justin Herbert was the ninth most quarterback sacked last year. You need a blindside protector. Get yourself one of the best in this draft class. If one falls to you, he did. And his name is Rashawn Slater. So again, GM Tom Telesco selects his third Big Ten product from the Big Ten Power 5 Conference in the first round. So again, they went ahead and doubled down on their gains, protecting Justin Herbert, their franchise quarterback, because that's what you need to do for Justin Herbert to have any continued success, especially when he's going into a new system. So that's why I like this move. They needed a blindside protector. Eliza Vera Tucker was going one pick later to the New York Jets. And as you know, the Jets traded up from 23 to 14 to go ahead and get them. They had their pick of the poison or pick of the litter, I should say. And they went after Rashawn Slater, which is a really, really smart move. And again, GM Tom Telesco is not one to really reach for need, especially when it comes to the offensive tackle position. The last time he did it was his first year as GM back in 2013 when he drafted the Alabama Roll Tide Roll, DJ Fluker, who some would consider an offensive guard because they didn't think he had the quick feet. However, Tom Telesco loved his rare athletic ability and thought his arm length would allow them to keep edge rushers at bay. Obviously, we know how that experiment failed. And he is no longer with the team. So, again, what I like about Rashawn Slater, this is break it down. He's strong at the point of attack. He is one of those players that can reach block. He has a good high football intelligence. That's something that you really need from GM Tom Telesco because, again, he comes from the Bill Polian, Ryan Grigson tree. That's what they look for in the football character. 
and some of the things that they look for in terms of what they want for their specific scheme fits. And again, Slater was a perfect scheme fit, right? And he's going to be responsible for protecting Justin Herbert's blind side for the next four to five years. So I really like this pick. They needed to address the number one need. They did so without having to move up in the draft in order to get the guy that they wanted all along in Rashawn Slater. Now, again, I said this on my earlier live streams and my pre-draft live streams that a lot of these quarterbacks are going to be pushed up the board. A lot of these better players are going to be pushed down the board and someone's going to benefit off of it. The LA Chargers are a prime example of that. So if I was to grade this first round pick, I would have to give them a grade of an A. Good job, GM Tom Telesco. Now moving on, let's go ahead and talk about that second round pick. In the second round, again, they let the board talk to them and they really benefited. They went ahead and drafted Asante Samuel at number 47, who in my grading system was my top ranked nickelback in this entire draft class. Now he's going to be asked to play boundary cornerback but don't be surprised if they kick him inside on obvious passing situations, especially in that third down sub package. Here's what we see from Asante Samuel and why it was a good pick, right? You talk about going for need, right? Teams reaching for need, diminishing the value of the pick, these other players, better players falling down the board. Well, let's take into account and peel back another layer of the onion to get to the court, as I always like to say. The Jacksonville Jaguars under GM Trent Baalke, GM Trent Baalke, he had his choice of the cornerbacks. He went, as, went after Tyson Campbell out of Georgia. I get the upside. I get the, the upside that they like in that player. However, I don't like that selection. I also don't like the selection of Stanford offense to tackle Walker Little. All right, so both those players went before Asante Samuel, and Jaguars had two shots of getting Asante Samuel, and they opted not to get Asante Samuel. So in a sense, they did themselves a disservice, shot, shot themselves in the foot. Same thing could be said of the Oakland Las Vegas Raiders, I should say, as they reached first free safety Trayvon Morig. They only made that selection due to getting sloppy thirds because Jovan Holland already was drafted beforehand. And at number 40, the Atlanta Falcons took Richie Grant. So when you take the third rated safety off the board or the third safety off the board, okay, if he's not the third rated safety off the board, whatever, you knew that there was some kind of discrepancy there as to who the top safety was. And that's what I was hearing. And the only reason Trayvon Morig, or Myrig, or however you pronounce his last name, was rated so highly is because this is a weak safety class. Same with Javon Holland. Same with Richie Grant. This is a weak safety class. Uh, safety class, excuse me. Now I'm not saying it's a bad safety class, but it's weak. And I'm not saying these guys aren't going to be perennial All Pro players or Pro Bowl players. They absolutely could. But this was not the strongest safety class. And which is why the Raiders are always doing bad year in and year out because they reach for players like Alex Rutherford at number 17, which you will see in my podcast that I did just prior to this one. All right. So anyways, with that being said, Asante Samuel drops, he drops, he drops. And then the Niners who are sitting there at 43 decide to trade back from 48 when they could have had Asante Samuel at 43. And then they opted to take Aaron Banks because the LA Chargers take Asante Samuel at 47, who just goes one pick earlier. So they missed out on getting the top nickelback in this draft class. Why? I don't know. Because K1 Moons is playing on a one-year deal, and you need a nickelback for the foreseeable future. Uh, Asante Samuel, wouldn't he be a better fit than going after a guy like Aaron Banks, who's not even a scheme fit? Another Notre Dame offensive lineman? Go figure. Hey, but I ain't John Lynch. And the pick was Asante Siamu going on to the LA Chargers and GM Tom Telesco just hits out of the ballpark. He's probably laughing to himself. Oh, the Niners traded back. They missed out on Asante Siamu. We're going to get Asante Siamu because we pick before the 49ers are on the clock. Boom. That's what happened. And again, Asante Siamu is going to get his rise as a starting boundary cornerback because, again, the depth there with the LA Chargers is not very strong. When you look at what they have currently on their roster, you look at guys like Tavon Campbell and Michael Davis. Those guys are not going to get it done. You guys are probably saying to yourselves, who? Yeah, exactly. So you can see where GM Tom Telesco solidifies his top two needs in the first two rounds of the draft. Got Rashawn Slater, the blindside protector in the first round. Doubles down on those gains with Asante Samuel in the second. So again, you see that the players that were left, Casey Hayward's now off to the Raiders. Desmond King is, was traded to the Tennessee Titans as a midseason trade last year. So those two starters are now no longer with the team. Obviously, I just mentioned the entrenched starters. and who are basically nobodies, and they needed somebody in return. So they went ahead and got Asante Samuel. So if I was to put a grade on this selection in the second round for GM Tom Telesco, I would give them an A. Now, this is where it gets really interesting, all right? At wide receiver, Josh Palmer, 
was the team's third round pick, number 77. Is the ticker up? Yeah. All right. This is where I thought they should have went running back or offensive guard. This is where they kind of diminished the value pick because they themselves reached for need, right? And if you needed an offensive guard and you needed help for Justin Herbert's progression in his second year, wouldn't you want to solidify the offensive line even further? Now, I know you got Rashawn Slater in the first, but why don't you double down on those gains and go after a guy like Quinn Miners? I mean, right now you have Ode Abushi entrenched as a starter. Is he going to get it done? No, he's not. He's not. That's going to be a weak link on the offensive line. So why not go after a senior bowl standout like Quinn Miners, who was just sitting there, right? He's a top 50 rated player on my big board. And you get him at number 77. That's great value there, right? That is great value. And again, if not going to go offensive guard, why not go running back? Because we all know about Austin Eckler's recent injury history. That's cause for concern. So with Michael Carter or Trey Sermon sitting there, wouldn't have been solid plays to go after one of those guys as an added insurance policy. Okay. So let's take it a step further, peeling back another layer of the onion to get to the core. If not offensive guard, if not running back, you go wide receiver, but why go Josh Palmer? There's other higher rated wide receivers on the board. I mean, you could have went after a player like Dami Brown or Amari Rogers. Both of those players are higher rated and this draft class is very deep. So again, you didn't have to reach for a wide receiver, but if you did, why not take higher rated players on most teams, big boards, and those two players, De'Ami Brown and Amari Rogers, who go, who just go picks later. It just makes no sense to go after a guy like Josh Palmer, who's very inconsistent in his play. Now, he's a good deep threat, but again, and I get the reason why they went this route, because again, they have Keenan Allen as the entrance starter. He's going to be there for many years to come. And then you have Mike Williams, their first round pick, playing in the last year of his, of his contract, rookie contract, because they picked up his fifth year option. I get it. The need was there. But again, anytime you reach for need, Diminish the value of pick. I thought they should have went in another direction with Quinn Miners, Michael Carter, Trey Sermon, pick your poison. Any one of those three players would have been better options. And if you were to stick wide receiver and the war room was not going to budge on drafting a wide receiver, there are higher rated players on my big board in Jamie Brown and Amari Rogers. So if I was to put a grade on this third round pick, I would have to give them a letter grade of a D. All right. Sorry, GM Tom Telesco. They had another third round pick at number 97. They went after a guy by the name of Trey McKitty out of Georgia. Again, tight end Trey McKitty at num uh, number 97 was another need-based pick. I don't know why they went after him. I know they lost Hunter Henry to the New England Patriots. I get it. But McKitty over Quinn Miners is questionable. Let me say that again. McKitty over Quinn Miners is very questionable. As Quinn Miners goes one pick later to the Denver Broncos, and again, stays within the division in the AFC West. So again, killing two birds with one stone, the Denver Broncos benefit. GM George Payton knows this. He went ahead and made a play for Quinn Myers. He's probably su surprised that GM Tom Telesco didn't miss one time, but two times on drafting Quinn Myers. Now Quinn Myers stays within the division and they have to face him two times a year. So again, if you're not going to go Quinn Myers, again, you could have went running back. You could have got a guy like Michael Carter. would have been great value. He just went 10 picks later to the New York Jets. Why not go after one of those guys? I don't know. But they didn't. They didn't. And they needed an insurance policy for Austin Eckler, a change of pace back. I think Michael Carter would have been a solid fit. Unfortunately, they didn't do that. And they went after Trey McKitty. So with that being said, they really lost out in the third round altogether. I'm going to have to give them a grade of a D for selecting Trey McKitty when Quinn Miners and Michael Carter were still on the board. All right, not too much to talk about as far as the remaining draft picks. They went after and got Chris, uh, Chris Rumpf, the outside linebacker, in the fourth round, number 118. They got offensive tackle Braden James in the fifth round, number 159. They got inside linebacker Nick Neiman in the sixth round, number 185. They got running back. Finally, they get a running back. Go figure. Larry Roundtree, the third, in the sixth round, number 198. He's not going to make the team. And safety, Mark Webb, seventh round, number 241. He's not going to make the team. So if I was to go ahead and put a solid letter grade on this entire draft class when it comes to the LA Chargers, again, I like the first two picks. I mean, they hit out of the ballpark. But in the third round, that's when you're really going to see some of the grades come out for me where teams are either going to get A grades or a B grade or from a B to a C grade is in that third to fourth round. This is not a very deep class, which is why that's the meat of my draft grade when it comes to it because at the top of the draft you have to hit but it's in the middle rounds you know the third fourth fifth round picks i really need to hit on and they didn't they missed they whiffed 
twice in the third round. So if I had to put a solid grade on it, I like the early day two picks, the early day one picks. I didn't like the picks in the third round that they made in the later half of day two. So if I had to put a letter grade on the entire draft class for GM Tom Telesco on the uh, and the LA Chargers, it would have to be a grade of a B. All right, well, that's it for this podcast. If you like my analysis and insights, please be sure to hit the subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner of your screen as you stay up to date on all things Beast in real time. So Beast Rider family, what are your thoughts? I love engaging with you on this platform. Please leave your comments. And again, welcome to the Beast Rider family. Thank you so much for tuning in. Take care. I'll be hopping on another premiere video podcast as we now wrapped up the AFC West. We're now delving into NFC East starting with the Philadelphia Eagles. Fly, Eagles, fly. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have a good day. Beast Rider, out.